recording. Okay, awesome. Well, welcome to our Faculty Friday session for this week. My name is Lauren Samuelson. I am an admission counselor at Center College, and I'm so excited to introduce you to one of my very favorite professors on campus and a dear friend, Dr. Bo Weston. Um, and so I'm going to let him introduce himself and to share a little bit of where he's from, where he went to school, primary areas of study, and his introduction to Center. So if you want to go ahead and do that. So I'm Bo Weston. I'm from Plymouth Meeting, Pennsylvania and lived in southeastern Pennsylvania in the Philadelphia suburbs uh, through high school. And then I went to Swarthmore for college, which is also in that area. Uh, my wife and I then went to Yale for grad school. And uh, we lived in Harrisburg for her first job. And then we both worked in the US Department of Education, which was the farthest west I had ever lived, Washington, DC, uh, before I moved out to Kentucky, moved over the mountains. So. Uh, coming to Kentucky introduced the whole middle of the country to me in a practical <laughs> way, which has been lovely. Uh, we have now lived in Danville for 30 years, uh, raised our three children here, uh, got to help start the anthropology and sociology program. And uh, my interests initially were uh, um, religion and in family. That was the work that I had done my dissertation on and worked on in the Department of Education. But really, when you're a small college teacher, you learn all kinds of stuff. And <laughs> I've actually lost track of how many different topics I have taught at Center. I think it's more than 40. Wow. <laughs> which is insane. Um, but it does mean that we get to read widely and know all kinds of stuff. Uh, in recent years, I have been working on happiness as a subject. I, I had a sabbatical on it. I had been teaching a course called the Happy Society. I got an NEH grant to uh, teach that in, in depth in relation to uh, past scholars. So we put in a lot of Aristotle and a lot of Tocqueville. Um, our, in this fall, we're starting a new first year student sequence, the Doctrina Lux Mentis sequence. So I'm taking my Happy Society upper level course and taking, as it were, just the first part of it, the happy life, to teach as a DLM one uh, writing intensive course starting this fall, eight o'clock Monday morning in, in the fall term, uh, <laughs> on how to live more happily and how to create more happy communities. Very exciting. That's awesome. The Happy Society is always the class I wish I had gotten at Center. I think for some reason it never fit my schedule, which is really sad. <laughs> but I took several other of your courses that we'll, I'm sure we'll get to at some point. Uh, well, now looking back on kind of your career and how you became a college professor, you know, specializing in sociology in these studies, when did you, an undergrad or maybe before then, when did you have that moment when you realized this is what you wanted to do? Well, it was probably nerdier than most people, uh, and that's not unusual for college professors. Uh, so I knew in high school that I wanted to go to Swarthmore College, uh, an unusually nerdy school where my parents had attended, and uh, probably to be a college professor. And I knew that I was interested in sociology, even in high school. Um, that worked out very well. I had an excellent experience there. Uh, I also met my wife there, so that's uh, doubly good, and uh, pursued that. I went straight on to grad school, um, and the thing that I had added in my studies that was unexpected was uh, to become more religious and to un want to understand religion. So at Yale, I did a degree in divinity as well as a PhD in sociology, and um, that has uh, worked out well. My, my first... Um, scholarly interest was in the sociology of religion. Uh, when I got to work in the Department of Education, the thing that I was tasked to do was talk about the educational role of families. So I had not formally studied sociology family life in, in grad school, but I taught myself as part of that job in the Department of Education. And, and that has become, in a, in a way, my signature class at Center is the sociology of family life. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very happy class. I teach it every spring. Um, it's heavy in seniors who are taking it for very practical reasons. Um, a lot of them uh, already have the person in mind that they'd like to start a family with. Uh, and so it's been uh, just a, a joy to teach that course uh, for 30 years. 
yeah, it's a really fun one. That's by far one of my favorite classes I took at Center. And um, I still talk to my friends about how it really did shape how we live as adults, <laughs> think about family and moving forward. So I still have several of the books, <laughs> reread them every so often. But yeah, that was definitely one of my favorite courses. Looking back to undergrad, how would you describe undergraduate Bo Weston? What were you like as a college student? You were with them all the time, so you can probably compare <laughs> what you were like. <laughs> um, I, I was an intellectual. I was a, a, a nerdy student. I did all kinds of things, particularly freshman year. I went to just try stuff. So um, I was, I'm not at all athletic. I was always the kid picked last in gym. <laughs> We had a gym requirement, so I took field hockey, and that turned out to be the women's field hockey team. <laughs> so I practiced with them every day, and after a couple weeks, the coach said, well, if you're going to practice with us, you might as well play. So my glorious intercollegiate athletic career consisted of a season of JV field hockey on the women's team. <laughs> That's awesome. Was to do, a good experience. Glad I did it. Um, but my freshman year, I was in three plays. I was in student government. I wrote for the student newspaper. Um, I was in the choir, which recorded an album back in the days of actual vinyl record albums and performed in New York at Lincoln Center. Um, uh, and I met my wife. So it was a pretty good freshman year. Uh, from there on, I mostly concentrated on my studies. Uh, and that was um, a nerdier thing. My wife, who is even smarter and nerdier than I am, <laughs> uh, you know, was the highest honors graduate, uh, went on to law school, um, and we have uh, been uh, happily associated since then. She is a dean's daughter, uh, so she was delighted to, to be a, a member of the faculty community again, mm -hmm. and has been uh, delighted to have college students coming through our home for years and years. Our, our own children are now all out of college and graduated and out in the world being grown-ups. Um, but I think it was good for them to grow up as faculty brats. It's kind of a magical way to live. Yeah, that's really cool. We should, yeah, we should have your wife on here too. That would have been really fun. <laughs> I remember she would come to some of our classes, which I always really enjoyed. Yeah, you two are quite the pair. Very smart, <laughs> very well read, <laughs> which I appreciate. Um, okay, thinking back to, I know you said you've been at Center for now 30 years, which I'm sure feels like a long time. And um, when you were looking at different faculty positions, you had been at different kinds of places. What drew you to the Center community? Well, I have to tell you, uh, College teaching is a great job. It's really the best job in the world. And so it's a buyer's market. So for three years when I was in the Department of Education, I applied to every job in America. <laughs> and, um, I'm a small liberal arts college bigot. I really totally favor them. I went to them, my parents went to them, my sisters went to them, all my kids went to them. Uh, so that was what I wanted to be at a, a smaller large college and have a teaching first focus with scholarship subordinate, um, which is not what a lot of people coming out of graduate school want, right? They assume that they'd rather be at a research institution and put up with teaching because it's how you pay the rent. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to be at a place like Center. Uh, so I was very grateful to get the interview, to come out and uh, see the place and um, the bonus of being able to start the anthrosocial program with my dear colleague, Phyllis Passarello, uh, was just gravy. Yeah, that's awesome. I didn't know that you all did that. That's really cool, looking back. Mm -hmm. Awesome, so I feel like I have a lot of conversations with students about this and, um, you know, we get the, the question, you know, is center hard? <laughs> do you do a lot of schoolwork? Which, yes, you will do some studying. Um, mm -hmm. From your experience, how would you describe the academic culture of center? Um, it, it is hard, which is good. So students think they want an easy course while they're taking it, but as soon as it's done, they're glad of all the work they had to put in. Mm -hmm. And on the rare occasions when they have something that they think is easy, uh, they resent it afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, I tell students, you know, if you're, when you're taking a class of so taking Introduction to Sociology, talk to your friends who are at other places who are taking Introduction to Sociology and compare your syllabus with theirs. And uh, almost always, ours is significantly more work. It's more reading, it's especially more writing, it's a lot more personal connection. Um, you know, our maximum class size is 30. 
which means that I can not only know every student in every class, but I can call on every student in every class. And that becomes part of the norm, part of the, the community. Um, personally, I think we have classes in order to foster out of class conversation. Mm -hmm. And so I know a whole bunch of them out of class and try to go to some extracurricular thing every week, a, a, a play, a sporting event, a lecture, a convocation, and just uh, have students over the house, something like that. Mm -hmm. And that's really the glory of a small college like Center. Mm -hmm. uh, years ago, there was a, a photographer for the college who had gone to a big state university. And she said to me, this stuff about having students over to your house, that's really just hype, isn't it? And I said, well, I got a group coming over tonight. Why don't you come? <laughs> and she interviewed them. At the end of the interview, she said, man, I wish I'd brought a photographer. I said, well, I got another group coming tomorrow. Come on back. <laughs> and that, that's a real thing that happens here. Yeah. Uh, Facebook has been a boon to me because I get to keep up with alums. Mm -hmm. And I have, I don't know, 800 alum friends in Facebook. And uh, yeah. that's been great. That's awesome. That's really cool. I know that was one of the things when I, I went to a large public high school before I came to center and, you know, I heard, okay, you're going to get to know professors. And I was like, yeah, yeah, like whatever. <laughs> Cause you know, I just, I got to know my teachers in high school, but it was never like a close because my classes were a lot larger and I got to center and you do, you start going to professors homes for dinner or they know about your life. Like I remember when one of my professors knew when my childhood dog passed away and you're like, how do you, <laughs> how do you have the time to care? And um, it's just really cool. And I think for me, it really helped just in my own development, not only academically, but just personally. And um, it really does make center feel more like a home environment because you see your professors, you know, a few times a week for sure. But then um, having those opportunities to get to know them and they're not, I always thought you all would be very intimidating <laughs> starting out of college because I was like, they're so smart and, you know, I'm just learning so much, but it was, I never felt that way. So it was definitely one of my favorite parts of center, but Thinking a little bit more specifically about sociology and anthropology, and you know, you know the bones of this since you started it at Center. Um, what would you want students to know about your department and the opportunities that come with that major or minor at Center? Yeah. So uh, I think it's a blessing that we have a joint program, anthropology and sociology. They really go together, and um, probably fewer than half of uh, colleges now have that still, but there really are counterparts. Uh, they were born together historically. Um, my take on this is that sociology is the modern study of modern societies, and anthropology was born in the colonial era as the modern study of non-modern societies. That's why they're so complementary. Um, I think, too, sociology is the one discipline that lets you see the big picture, mm -hmm. right? That everybody lives in a bubble sociolo sociologically. And if you try to think of what most people are like, just based on your personal experience, you'll always be wrong, right? There's no way to know whether your experience is typical or unusual until you can see what the whole picture looks like, whether you're in the tail of the distribution or in the middle of the curve. And sociology is the discipline that was born to do that. That's really cool. Yeah, I always say that. Um, I wish I, anthrosocial is the one thing I wish I'd majored in. I was a history major, which I did love being a history major. Um, mm -hmm. But by the time I was a junior or senior, I was taking so many anthrosocial classes that I was like, I might as well have done this too. Um, but, and I don't know if you know this, but you're, I took social structure with you my, I believe it was my sophomore and junior year. And we read an article about what it was like to be poor at an Ivy League school. It was from the Boston Globe, I think. I think you had assigned it as one of the choices for article reading, I think, one week. Um, and that was the article that made me want to work in higher ed. And so I just, I think it, it really was, I mean, when I think of formative classes at Center, it was the sociology classes that really helped me develop my worldview and what I wanted to do and how I was going to use my education moving forward. So, um, Thank you for that. You know, it really did help and it definitely influenced where I went after center too. And I still remember the article and talking about it at the hub, <laughs> which we'll talk about later, but <laughs> um, discussing that article with small groups and with you. And that was such a big part of my center experience too. So, um, well, I took several of your classes. I took social structure. I did take family life. I feel like those are the, the two major ones that I took, but you do teach a variety of courses. I know I think I tried to get into the coffee shops or coffee house class, <laughs> but I don't think I got in. I think it was my first year. 
I'm not bitter at all, but I'd love to take it one day. <laughs> um, but do you have a, I know you said you have some that are kind of your forte or the ones you're known for, but do you have a favorite class that you teach or one that you always look forward to? Well, family life is, is probably the most fun because of most of the people taking it, uh, you don't have to persuade them that the subject is interesting, right? They come because they really want to know how to, how to live their lives. And I think every subject could be approached that way, and some students do. They see, you know, I really want to understand the social structure to understand where I fit in. I want to understand American religion or uh, even social theory. Um, but uh, family life is the one where people know that already. Yeah, yeah. I even remember the first year, they're like, this is the class you want to take, like senior year, because it filled up a few <laughs> before. It was all seniors usually, because they all wanted to take it. It was at 8 a.m., which was a bit challenging. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I made it. <laughs> I, I've taken pity on on the um, the the Zoomers who just can't manage to get up at eight, so I've moved it to a nine ten class. That's very kind. <laughs> it was definitely doable, but I my roommate was also in the class, and she struggled a little bit, bit more than I did. But um, mm -hmm. for sure, that was one of my favorite classes, and it, it is so interesting just because it was so applicable. And um, I love that you brought in center alums to speak about their experience. Like it just felt very like a prep course for adulthood, which was helpful uh -huh. too. So I lo definitely love that course. But um, well, I knew you before taking you as a student. Um, I think the first time I interacted with you was I was in the Bonner Scholars Program and you came uh -huh. to lead a privilege exercise, which I still remember to this day. Um, but you're involved outside the classroom quite a bit with a lot of student groups. Um, uh -huh. Can you tell us about your experience advising groups on campus, getting to know students? Um, what has that been like for you as a professor at Center? Yeah, and that is half the pleasure. I mean, really half the Center experience is outside of the classroom. And that's not just for, for students, um, but also for faculty involvement with students. So I've been an advisor to Alpha Phi Omega, which is a co-ed service organization. And that has been a, a world of students I wouldn't otherwise see and organized around doing service, which is a thing I love. Mm -hmm. And there's some overlap between them and Bonner and, and a lot of, um, a lot of anthrosocial majors are Bonners. So we've benefited from that. Yeah. Um, uh, we are a posse school, and um, uh, the short version of posse is it's we partner with Boston. Boston Posse finds a group of students from schools we probably wouldn't be able to recruit in mm -hmm. uh, and form them into a mutual support organization, a posse in 80s slang. And they have a mentor who advises them for their four years here. Well, I was mentor to Posse 1 and have stayed involved in the Posse program just as a friend of since then. Um, I have also been advisor and player in the badminton club for <laughs> more than 20 years. I forget exactly when we officially started that. Um, I was uh, advisor to Center Democrats for a number of years and still remain active in that. I'm actually chair of the county party now, so we, if the party works with the college uh, in an official way uh, now. And then, you know, the thousand and one nonce things that happen, uh, student groups to, to do this and that. Mm -hmm. um, we had Presbyterian group for a while that I worked with, other student religious groups, service projects to go here and there. Um, in our, I, I've taught in our study abroad. Uh, so I directed the London program one time. I've taken students in the center term to South Africa and to Australia. Uh, I've taught in the Study Away program in D.C. several times, uh, really every year that I can, every year that it's existed. Um, and so those are also ways of connecting with students that necessarily have an out-of-class component. Yeah, very cool. That's awesome. I didn't. I knew you had London program, but I don't think I knew about South Africa and Australia. Those are really, really fun. <laughs> Those are awesome. Yeah, we talk about study abroad quite a bit, but that professor relationship while you get to go abroad is one that's definitely really strong too. And um, a lot just for students that are watching, uh, most of our study abroad programs, especially the January ones, are led by a faculty member. And so they really kind of are like your parent, caretaker, helper, <laughs> and professor. They take on a lot of roles. Um, but that was, I mean, that was one of the reasons I studied abroad. The several times I did just because I felt so safe and comforted and also challenged at the same time, which is a good thing. 
<laughs> but badminton, I do see you play badminton quite a bit on campus. Do you guys have like a set schedule? <laughs> Does it happen just by pickup game? How long have you been playing? I've always wondered, you know, how long have you been playing badminton on campus? So, um, I took badminton as a gym class when I was an undergraduate. Okay. That started a lifelong love. So when I came here, there was not a club but there were a couple people who wanted to play. And in those days we had a gym requirement. So I actually taught it as a gym class. And okay. for a long time, the club were former students from the gym class who, who kept playing. But we play Monday, Wednesday, Friday at four, year round, really. We play in the summer, whoever's here. Um, and that club has gone on, I forget when exactly, but it's at least 20 years, maybe 25 years that we've had an official club. It's awesome. Very fun. <laughs> I'll have to one day learn. I haven't learned yet. That's great. Well, thinking back to the academic side of your role, and well, this is probably a little bit more outside the classroom, but um, I know you work with students who start as first year and you work with them through senior year, especially with our senior seminars that we get to lead. Um, how do you specifically support graduating seniors when it comes to career planning, academic study? Do you find yourself having a role in that process? Oh, yeah. Um, so, in our anthrosocial program, we have a, a senior seminar each long term, and the sociologists do it in the fall and the anthropologists do it in the spring. And one of the reasons I like to do it in the fall is senior fall is the crucial moment for future planning. So in senior seminar, we, we talk explicitly about what are you doing next? How can this research project that we're doing for senior seminar be part of your career plan? It can be the portfolio item that you take forward. Um, I actually usually start working with the seniors the May before that, as soon as they sign up for the class in the previous term, and through the summer to, to plan how the thing that they're going to write about is related to what they want to do in life, or at least what, what they want to do next. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it's a formal part of senior seminar. It's an informal part with all my advisees. Um, it's not at all unusual for students to try this and that for a couple of years and then set on a path that leads more professional. So it's really that three years out conversation that begins with, I'm thinking of going to graduate school to do this thing. Would you write a letter for me? Would you give me advice? Would you connect me with alums who do that sort of thing? Uh, and that happens all the time. Uh, that's uh, one of the reasons that we maintain this continuous relation. And, and actually, um, I've had an alumni seminar every summer mm -hmm. for 15 years, maybe. I forget how, when we started. I know that the class of 2004 has been central to it. So it used to be we'd meet on campus and people would come back in the summer, alumni. Mm -hmm. But there's so many alums in Louisville that two members of the class of all four have hosted it uh, for uh, at least the last dozen years in their house. So we'll pick a book, I'll put on Facebook, here's the book we're thinking about, and now we get a range from current students to people who graduated 25 years ago. Read a book, get together, talk about it, eat afterwards, it's a wonderful, wonderful day. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, I tell them, center never ends, you're a colonel for life. It's a, it's a, a long-term uh, <laughs> association. Yeah, that's so cool, that's awesome. And I, I remember when I graduated, I left center and I, I was only gone three years, but I came back and I was like, I, I knew you would remember me. And I knew some professors that I'd been close to, but people would be like, hey, how was you know, grad school in Texas? And how is your family doing and your dog? And I was like, how do you remember all this? Um, and it is, it's really cool to have that continuing academic and personal experience and get to share that too. That's very, very cool. I, I will say that we have a very collegial faculty. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's not, not a given, even in small places. Sometimes they just fight a lot. They fight with each other and they fight with the administration. We do that a lot less. Yeah. And in part because the kind of people who want to stay and make a career teaching here are the kind of people who want to be, know you, right? To know about your life and your connections and what you do thereafter. And people who don't want that don't stay. Yeah. I can see that too. I don't think, I think I took that for granted as a student in undergrad because it, it just became something that was so normal. Like you're like, oh, of course I'm going over for dinner or I'm, I'm gonna dog sit for my professor this weekend and it's so normal. But then I got to graduate school and it 
not that they weren't personal, but it wasn't the same kind of connection. And they cared more about my research than my personal life. And that's okay too, but it was just, it was a completely different experience. And I don't even think I knew how much I wanted that until I got, got it in undergrad. And uh, it meant a lot to me. And especially for students that come from so far from home, you know, I saw my parents three times a year. And so I saw my faculty and staff advisors way more often. <laughs> um, and it was nice to feel like I had people who were keeping tabs on me and cared about me too. So that was really important. Mm -hmm. Speaking of our faculty, quite a, just a little bit, you know, there are some, there's some really rock star faculty at Center and, you know, it's a great group. Are there any faculty members that you wish had taught you when you were a student or any classes that you wish you could have taken that are happening at Center? Well, actually, I do take classes. I have. Do you uh, really? <laughs> oh yeah. No, I've, I've, mm, every, on average, every couple of years, um, okay. I'll take one. I took uh, Tara Strauch's American Revolution course uh, two years ago, and that's the most recent one. Okay. Um, but all, all kinds over the years, uh, literature and history, mostly things that I'm yeah. interested in but don't know. Yeah. Uh, and I, some, some of our, our long established professors, I took the last time they taught okay. this course. That's really cool. I know, I need to get on that. I need to take your courses I haven't taken yet. It gives me, maybe, to, maybe virtually I could take some, who knows? So um, just thinking a little bit more about Danville and kind of our community. And, you know, I know you and I both really love Danville, but um, for coming, I mean, I came 16 hours away. You came from the opposite direction to come to Danville. Um, it's a big change and you know, I had never been to Kentucky before I started college and um, Danville is something I've grown to absolutely love. But what were your first impressions of Danville? What has your experience in the Danville community been like? How would you explain Danville to an outsider? Right. So it is a lovely small town. Mm -hmm. And in that respect, it's a lot like small towns everywhere. Um, it is the kind of place where some people think you had to be born here to be in, but it's really not true. Almost everything is run by people who are from elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's pretty welcoming to that. If you throw yourself into the community, then you become part of it. Um, I quickly learned that it does not, Danville does not think of itself as a college town. Mm -hmm. It thinks of itself as a nice small Southern town with a college in it, mm -hmm. in the same way that it has a hospital in it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that on the whole is a good thing. Uh, there are places that really are college towns that are the college that dominates the town mm -hmm. that tends to breed some resentment from townies who are not connected with the college and we don't have that here very much okay. uh, and i'm i'm glad of that that's a good thing mm -hmm. uh center is right on the edge of downtown so all of the downtown is easy walking distance from the college um, and the hub coffee house which you have mentioned already um, my favorite haunt. I go there every day. I teach a course on coffee houses. Um, that is readily accessible to students, and there are regulars who come there to do their study. Yeah, that's very cool. Yeah, I, as a student, I don't even think I got to know Danville even enough, but being back and being a staff member, I feel like I've really immersed myself in the Danville community, and it is, it's just all those things, and I've always felt like Danville really matches the welcoming community of Center. It's not that they, like, fight each other, but there really is a similar kind of feeling on both sides, I feel like, of downtown and on campus. And so it's something that I never thought I would live at Danville yet, <laughs> but I found myself back here and I'm really thankful for it just because it is, even as a young staff member, you know, it's a very welcoming and very caring community, which has been really, really nice to be a part of. But. I will say that students tend to live in the center bubble all the time. Yes. <laughs> and so there's just, you know, way so much going on on campus. Mm -hmm. They stay involved in it and the social life of the college. It's, it's uh, overwhelmingly residential. You all eat together. Um, it's not commuters at all. And that's yeah. rare right, like, to live blocks away. Yeah. Um, and so some students <laughs> tend to regard anything off campus as equally far. <laughs> um, it's so bad. Uh, you know, if I, if I ask them to come meet me at the coffee house, which is three blocks from campus, <laughs> sometimes they'll drive because in their thought, that's like going to Lexington. <laughs> my house is half a block from campus. And I tell them, if you drive to my house, I will make fun of you. <laughs> um, and it sometimes takes a, an iteration or two before they take that seriously. It is so true, though. It is such a campus experience. Like someone asks you to do something off campus and you're like, well, that's going to take 
an hour for me to get in your, you know, downtown really takes like less than 10 minutes to walk to, but mm -hmm. it does, it feels like a lifetime because, and I would even complain about walking across campus, which is about 15 minutes in total from corner to corner. And it's just ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, when but, I have gone to, you know, graduate school at a university, uh, everything in, in the campus seems like it's stone throw away. Yeah, I think I remember my first day of graduate school, which is just kind of embarrassing. Please don't be upset with me, but I was late to our first seminar because I was running on center time and not on university time. And I was like, well, if I get there, you know, 10 minutes to get to the spot, you know, it took me definitely closer to 20 to walk. And I was a little bit late, but I made an impression. So, <laughs> but I was never late again. So, um, but I'll never forget it. I was like, okay, this is not center. <laughs> Where I think, I remember I was late only to one class at center ever, and it was an 8 a.m. And I woke up at 8 a.m. But I still made it by like 8.05. Like it wasn't. <laughs> right. okay. I woke up, I just put on a sweatshirt, ran across the line, you know, it was nothing major, but I definitely took that for granted as an undergrad. It, was, it is, that, yeah. <laughs> that does remind me, um, we will track you down, <laughs> right? I mean, if you're, if you're not in class, I will ask your friends to text you and see if you're up. <laughs> and if your friends, if you have, you know, friends from high school who go to a big state U where they don't even take attendance and they don't care whether you're there or not. Yeah. This is a different experience. Yes, yeah, very. That's the that's the the left hand of care. Is yeah, <laughs> you're to be here. We'll track you down. <laughs> yeah, we'll find you. I know. Yes, you you will, and that's that's a good thing. Yeah, you want to be in class. You want to learn. Uh, that's so funny. Well, I know you don't just teach. I know you do a lot of things, <laughs> um, and I know that because I see you very active in our community, which is awesome. But do you have any certain hobbies that take? up a lot of your free time? What would you spend a free Saturday doing? What does your life look like outside of center? Well, I, hobby seems like an unnatural word um, to <laughs> me, in part because my labor is not alienated, right, in the terms that Marx would use. Um, I, I have been involved in politics since we got here, formerly as a foot soldier, but now I'm party chair, so I have to like organize stuff. Mm. Um, we have a trivia, every Monday night when there's not a pandemic going on um, and have a team that's a mixed group, not, not center people at all. Mm -hmm. um, I have raised money to plant trees in Danville every year for a decade. And that has taken me to a whole new set of connections. Um, I'm an elder of the Presbyterian church, which is the one that founded center. It's right next door to campus. And so just around the corner from my house. And that leads to another whole body of connections. I have three children. They all went to Danville schools. We were involved in schools. My wife is an education reformer, so she's really involved in schools. Um, uh, our neighborhood is the one adjacent to campus, mm -hmm. and it's a very active neighborhood in itself. So we've been active in doing St. Mildred's Court things. Yeah. And that's, uh, you know, of a, of a Saturday. And then, of course, um, I'm a teacher first, but a scholar second yeah. um so i i have written oh gosh you know 100 book reviews two dozen articles and six books while i've been here i uh, just wrote a book about louisville neighborhoods came out last year yeah. uh, so always I mean, first time especially in the summer but, but even stole some stolen time during the school year yeah that's so cool yeah, the six books i've read all of them i read the one um what i was going to ask you about was the historical account of center and its founding right. My parents own a coffee. They're huge fans <laughs> of your work, um, but they love it. And I just, you know, it is, it's such a, I recommend it to any student that's coming to center or interested. It's just a really great, great book. And maybe that's because I love history too, <laughs> but I. We came out with a, a revised bicentennial edition last year. So it's right. very current. Very updated. Yeah, that's awesome. I don't, we should have them everywhere. Um, is there one thing about when you were, researching for that book. I'm guessing you use like the archives at Center and all mm -hmm. that. I've, I use that for some of my historical research too, but was there anything about Center's history or founding that you found to be especially interesting or exciting to study? Yeah, I, I take the Center name seriously. And I think we have in fact pursued the middle path on controverted issues over and over again, mm -hmm. right? On, on, the founding, on the state relation, relation between the church and state, on slavery, on the Civil War, 
uh, on segregation, on integration, on co-education. We've, we've taken a middle path, uh, which has served us well. And I think that is now part of the DNA of the college and will likely be so going forward. Mm -hmm. So some people who might expect a Southern college to be very conservative, that's not us. Some people who think the liberal arts college is very liberal, that's also not us. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a thing to know about Senate. Yeah, that's a good, yeah, it's a good thought. And I think that's definitely true too. Very cool. I have my friends at home. I remember I was going to center and they thought it was Centre or Centra and I was yeah. <laughs> not how it's not how it's pronounced. Yeah, yeah. Um, is there one thing that just looking forward into the future and you know we have a new president and we have some I mean I'm, I know center is always evolving and changing and that's a good thing too but um, is there something that you hope never changes about center or the center experience? Uh, that we stay small and totally residential. Yeah. Um, I, I have been obliged to learn how to do online teaching because of the pandemic but I hope that as soon as there's a vaccine, we never do that again. <laughs> I know, I'm very impressed by how quickly you all were adaptable, but it just was, you know, this is so different than the norm for Center. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, my brother's a graduate student or was a graduate student this spring at a large research university where some of his classes were online and that was a very easy transition. You know, this wasn't a big deal, but for Center, I was like, this is, I mean, people didn't really understand, but I'm like, this is a big shift for us. And so. And, and really antithetical to what we do. And in particular, the thing I said before, that the extracurricular is half the experience, mm -hmm. and all of that was lost. And that's not just for students. I mean, our connection out of class with students just disappeared. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely, it's not, not the center experience that we know and love, but yeah. we will hopefully get back to that sooner than later, but <laughs> we will see. <laughs> um, but I agree. I think the fully residential too is um, a huge part of Center's experience and you do get to know people so well and it's very hard to not focus on being a student and being involved because you're right there. And um, mm -hmm. I always say that that's like the number one thing that led my college search was that I wanted a full residential experience and I'm so thankful that was something that I knew I wanted, but yeah. it is a big part of it for sure. So speaking of campus and the fact that everyone lives there, do you have a favorite spot on campus or a favorite place on campus? Yeah, I was thinking about that. Um, the fishbowl. Oh, the, okay. The classroom. <laughs> in the, so this, in the middle of campus, there's a library, which also has classrooms attached to it and most faculty offices, including mine. So it's a campus intellectual center of all kinds. But there's a little seminar room directly above the entrance to the library looks down on the giant statue of Abraham Lincoln, mm -hmm. is glass on all sides, which is why it's called the fishbowl. So I like to hold seminar there. Yeah. And I think it's just a lovely space in the campus and its openness is symbolic of how we conduct things. Yeah, that's very cool. That's awesome. I like that a lot. <laughs> super, super neat. And um, thinking more, I didn't, I didn't send you this question, so I'm putting you on the spot here. But do you have a favorite campus event or tradition that you look forward to? Is there anything in particular that really, maybe we missed it this year, I don't know, maybe something that stands out to you? Mm. Well, I do like the faculty caroling every year. Yes. Um, and when my kids were little, the student, the, the faculty kids and the deaf school kids would go trick-or-treating in the dorm. Okay, I remember hearing about that, yeah. <laughs> Your time it had been centralized in, in Hazelwig in the gym, I think. But yes, yes. It used to be, you know, we would just traipse little kids in costumes through the dorm. And I always saw those two things as related. That students did this wonderful thing for our children and then the faculty would come back and sing uh, in, in the campus spaces at Christmas time. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's been a pretty big group. I mean, the, the custom has gone on for 30 years, probably. Yeah. And uh, last year, we had more than two dozen uh, people out singing. So mm -hmm. it, it's a lovely custom. I really like that. Yeah, it was fun. I mean, as a student, you always look forward to it. And it really was just, I mean, when you're in finals mode, you're kind of just only focused on finals. And, um, <laughs> you know, pretty much everyone's camped out in the library for about four days straight but when the caroling comes it's just such a nice reminder that 
A, your faculty are not trying to hurt you with their files, <laughs> and that there's some joy, and, you know, it's just really, it does remind you of the center community, and it's just really nice, and it was cool this year to get to be on the other side of it, so it was a really fun, I never got to do it before this year, so it's, it is very fun. I got to see, like, the behind the scenes, <laughs> which is cool, so it's definitely one of my favorite traditions, too. That's awesome. <laughs> um, do you have a fun fact about yourself that you think current students might not know, or your past students may not have known? Mm. Um, th this may be TMI, but I have never shaved. Never. <laughs> really? <laughs> never wanted to. Uh, it always seemed like uh, more trouble than it was worth. And so students have asked, you know, what would it take to do that? So I, I said flippantly one time, a six-figure contribution to center. <laughs> and that kind of sets the bar high enough for them to think about. And, but I know there's some alums who at least have that as an idea that they might do someday. So, that would be pretty awesome. <laughs> I know that about you. Wow, that would be a, that'd be a pretty fun, yeah, giving event. <laughs> I don't know if alumni's caught on to that yet. <laughs> right. <laughs> they might keep that between us. That's pretty funny. That's awesome. Okay, well, we'll we'll have to start wrapping up a little bit soon. But mm -hmm. just looking back on, I mean, you've been integral to the center experience for decades now, and I feel like you're one of those professors that I got here, and they're like, "You have to take Dr. Weston at some point." And obviously, I'm so thankful that I got to. But um, just thinking about all the advice and the wisdom that you've given to students throughout the year, I wanted to ask you a couple questions. So mm -hmm. um, maybe for our first year students who are coming in, I know this fall is obviously going to be a bit different, but maybe just for any incoming first year college student, what would be a piece of advice that you would offer to them as they start their experience at center? Well, uh, try a range of things and new people. And most of the center students are already primed to want to do that. Mm -hmm. And if anything, they're likely to get overcommitted and do too much. Uh, particularly if you, know, you were the star of your high school and just did everything. Um, you'll find the academics here harder enough that you can't sustain that level of what you did as a senior in high school. But um, do some. Try try some you know new organization, new thing, new range of people, uh, and build on that. And that's the way to make friends and be happy. The people who are happy in college are the ones who make friends and have a focus to their passions. Yeah. Um, and and there's a dozen is not even a big enough number many many ways to do that um, but I think just set that as your goal that that's what you want to do yeah that's good advice <laughs> and now thinking about I mean for our seniors who maybe just recently graduated or for our rising seniors what wisdom would you share with them maybe when they're exiting center and going off into the great unknown of after center what would be advice that you typically share with them all right well and this comes right from the happiness research, is the thing that makes people happy is doing something with other people that serves a cause larger than themselves. Mm -hmm. If you just try to focus on yourself, you just try to focus on material success, that does not typically lead to happiness. It's just not fulfilling. Mm -hmm. So giving yourself to a larger project and doing it with other people, uh, with, almost regardless of what it is, uh, is a path to happiness, fulfillment, human flourishing, eudaimonia, and that is what I wish for my alumni. And if they set their sights high enough, a big enough cause larger than yourself, then they'll also run things in the world and that'll be good for everybody. <laughs> yeah, you're turning out good people. <laughs> that's great advice. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, really great. Things that I definitely think about too, moving forward. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'll end with la one last question. Uh, yeah. I know that you're a huge fan of the Hub Coffee House, which I'm also a huge Hub fan, but I'll never rival your dedication to them. I only hope that one day I can be as big of a fan. Um, but I've always wondered, what is your go-to order? What do you get at the Hub? Um, I have the same thing every day. <laughs> they know it, they see me coming in the door, they can start doing it. I have a mocha, uh, skim milk, two shots, no whipped, half chocolate. Um, okay. I, I, half, half chocolate, you said? Yeah, as you get older, you can't tolerate sweet as much as you could when you were a kid. Okay. So, uh, the, the regular dose is just too much. Uh, yeah. So, half of that is good. 
<laughs> well, good. I would, I've never known that. I've always wondered. So now I know. <laughs> yeah, I, I tell everybody, I think it's reasonable for anybody to be high maintenance about five things. Okay. Right? And you get, you get to pick your five, but okay. only five. And uh, you, know, you can't say, I want the best of everything. No, that's a pain in the neck to other people. But uh, the way that I like my mocha every day, that's one of my five. Okay. Okay. That's actually, I should probably take that advice. <laughs> <laughs> I probably need to take that in. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for being oh, here. And thank for you, dear. And thank you for being so cheery. Oh, anytime. And thank you, obviously, for the influence you've had on me as a student, as a professional. It's meant a lot. And it's fun to get to be back and work closely with you again. Um, and thank you for taking this time for our students who are watching. I know they'll really appreciate it. Sure thing. And if your students want to know stuff, they welcome to write to me. Perfect. Yep. Yeah. And they can find your information on the website or reach out to our admission office. And we're happy to connect you as well. So, All right. Well, thank you guys so much.